uh, or some of the economic aspects of this. And we've heard a lot this morning, and we'll no doubt hear a little bit more uh, this afternoon uh, about strikes. Um, and I want to speak about a very big and very successful strike that's been taking place and is ongoing in Britain. Um, and it's been going for a very long time. And it has there's, there was some give uh, for a while, but it's now fully back in operation and it, it needs to be broken. It's a strike on the favour of breaking. And that's an investment strike. Uh, the investment strike by uh, British businesses. If you look at the what's happened in the course of the recession, British output has fallen by £53 billion. Pounds. Uh, the refusal of the private sector to invest amounts to £46 billion. Pounds. That's 80% of the total, i.e. it's the private sector investment strike which is responsible for the recession. It's also, as a result, because the public sector deficit is a symptom of the crisis, it's not the crisis. It's also re directly responsible for 80% of the rise in uh, the public sector deficit. So it's, it's, it's the same cause for both the economic crisis and the fiscal crisis, that's the public sector finances, is an, is an investment strike by British capital. Now the reason that they're on strike and refusing to invest is because profits have fallen. And the purpose of, of investment, from a, from a point of view of a business, is to generate profits. Because they can't be certain of that, they are refusing to invest. Therefore, and this is how this relates to the issue of privatisation, privatisation comes into it in order to restore profitability for no additional investment, i.e. you take a perfectly well managed, we may have quibbles about exactly how they are managed and whose interest, but well-managed uh, public sector functions like education, like health, like transport and what you do is you simply hand them to the private sector and by, do, by in that way th their profits are boosted. Now for those of you who are old enough to remember uh, Thatcher in the 1980s, what you'll recall is that then the issue was allegedly about the need to control inflation and by doing so through monetarism, controlling the money supply. Oddly enough, although the, um, the disease identified currently, which is the public sector deficit, is, in, is entirely different uh, from then, oddly enough, the uh, medicine prescribed is exactly the same. The medicine prescribed is drive down wages, um, uh, cut public spending, and privatise. And the reason for for that, the reason that the medicine prescribed in both instances is the same, is because the and I can use this word now because because uh, Bromin set the set the bar. Um, <laughs> the reason, yeah, yeah, the re because the reasons given in both cases, that's the the inflation and controlling the money supply on the one hand, and currently the public sector deficit. They're bullshit. They're absolute bullshit. The purpose of the drive now is to increase profits in both cases. And that's how um, privatisation fits into the whole um, policy of the government. It's a, a mechanism to drive up uh, profits without any investment by um, the private sector. What, of course, that means is you get worse services, you, there are fewer jobs, um, and um, uh, the public loses out, the workforce loses out, but the profits do rise. Now, if you take individually some of the issues already mentioned, for example, on pensions, uh, I thought I knew a little bit about the pensions debate until I actually went to the Treasury's website recently. And in the terms of reference for the Hutton report, the very first point in the terms of reference is to remove the barrier to the private sector taking over functions of the public sector by reducing pensions in the public sector. Mm. It's got nothing to do with unaffordability. Pensions mm. are falling anyway Absolutely. because of the attacks on public sector pensions that were instituted by the Labour government. Uh, they're going to fall from 1.9% of GDP to 1.4% of GDP. That's the f almost the first chart in the Hutton report. But the purpose is, is to make it easier for the private sector to take over the function of, of, pension, uh, of, um, of, of the services conducted by the public sector. If you take the case of education, I remember, as I follow these things quite closely, I'm a member of the Labour Party, um, I'm following closely um, what uh, Lord Manderson did when he was business secretary, 
um, and very, very astute, he would go around different areas um, of the economy, speaking to business leaders and so on, and he would say, this is the type of, in of return you get on investment. So he would do this with higher education, uh, he would do it with space, he did it with rail and so on, and it's very detailed, it's, it's one of the few ways you get, because most uh, British um, public accounts are almost treated like state secrets. Um, one of the few ways you could get an official assessment of what return you get for investment in education, for example, what return you get for investment in transport, and so on. And they're huge returns. But Ma what Mandelson was saying was, these are huge re returns, and we're going to hand them over to you. Uh, well, of course, the same would apply, the same returns apply, for example, for public investment. So, for example, even the OECD says, we have all this, uh, again, bullshit about how graduates are the beneficiaries of a higher education and therefore they should pay some form of tax or levy or uh, fees and so on, or all the different varieties we've had. Um, but what's ignored entirely is what the public sector gets from investment in higher education. The OECD sets it out. The OECD says, uh, in its education at a glance, it says basically for every pound that the public sector invests, in higher education, it gets about four pounds back in taxes o over the life of, of the individual. And it actually, on its press release that accompanied um, education at a glance, it said, it had the headline, um, governments can uh, reduce the deficit and create jobs by increasing investment in higher education. Not a great headline. What they sh should have said is investment, not cuts. Because that's actually the reality of the situation. I'm going to end very shortly. Um, Broman's al already mentioned the NHS. It's absolutely true, to take that as an exa ex example. In Britain, 8.3% um, of GDP is spent on health. In the US, it's 16.3% of GDP. That's why Obama had the most mod moderate healthcare reform conceivable, simply because healthcare is eating up the US economy. You know, if the economy grows at 2.5% every year, but healthcare costs grow at 7% a year, which is what's been happening for 20 years, then at some point in the future, the whole of the US economy will have to be devoted to healthcare. So he, he tried to put a break on that. But the reality is, the healthcare provision uh, for those that have it in the US is no better than Britain. So they spend twice as much of national income, and, and again, over 50 million Americans don't have any uh, access to healthcare because it's more inefficient, because at every level, uh, some private sector uh, company has to take its profits. And if you have that on a cumulative basis, on, on, a, on a, um, a very complex um, uh, sector like health care, which requires lots of inputs from lots of different firms, then of course what happens is your money is going in profits. It's not going in health care. That's where the extra spending comes from. Just briefly and finally on this, what's the alternative to privatisation? Well, people talk about the struggles on the individual sectors, but in terms of the, the uniting these, um, clearly public sector ownership is far preferable because you don't get these ills. Now, um, uh, Tony's absolutely right. If you talk about the, the ideological offensive we've had since at least 1979, that the public sector is inefficient and useless and rubbish, and only the gleaming, new, shiny private sector can um, deliver anything efficiently, is again bullshit. But it has a lot of sway over people, because that's what they've heard for, since, for, for that entire period. However, if you ask them specifically about individual aspects of that, i.e. their attachment to in institutions like the NHS, um, the NHS is the most popular institution in the country, by far. Michael Ashcroft, the uh, billionaire donor to the Tory party, he uh, commissioned a huge piece of um, uh, research opinion poll research, and it, and it detailed what the most popular institutions in the, um, in the country were. The least popular, actually, was the Daily Mail. That was before the News of the World scandal. Um, the monarchy came in at 61% uh, approval, which put it mid-ranking. Mid mid I was surprised. I thought it might be worse than that. But by far, the uh, most popular institution uh, I think just under 90% was the NHS. Um, so specifically, people are attached to um, uh, public sector provision. What we need to do is make that more popular. What's not popular currently, for example, is 
public sector ownership of RBS and Lloyds. It's not popular. Um, and for years, people on the left, like me, have argued for nationalisation. Well, now we've got banks that are nationalised. But the left is somewhat silent, I think, on what we should actually do with them. Now, now we've got them. And they're not popular because most people feel that their taxes are going to pay bonuses for RBS bankers, and they're right. The reality is, RBS in particular is sitting on a mountain of cash, they, which they refuse to invest. Well, my calculation is they've got £64 billion pounds worth of uh, asset, assets they could lend. And they could lend it for building council houses, for transport, for infrastructure, for education. That's bigger than the £53 billion shortfall we've got from where we were before the recession began. That's the, that's the size of the mountain they, they could lend. We should be demanding that they lend it. We own the bloody thing. That would make, if they did it, nationalisation would be very popular. More to the point, it would also be a decisive turnaround for the economy. It would put literally millions of people back to work. That's what, that's what I think is a key demand and slogan that we should put forward in the period ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs>